Hi, it's uh, Wednesday uh, at noon, and uh, my name is Janet Fitch, and uh, this is Writing Wednesday, which is um, where we talk about all things writing, um, solve your problems, uh, answer your questions, and just see what see what's around to think about. Um, today, the day after the election, um, count still going on. It's been kind of a, it's been kind of crazy. Uh, and, uh, my way of coping is, is to, uh, hit the ground, just, um, meditate, stay off the news, watch, you know, watch national news at six, read the newspaper, um, and try to stay off the moment by moment, um, uh, in, infused dra drama, infused Twitter, uh, Anything that's moment by moment, uh, it's it's exciting. If you're, you know, a, an adrenaline junkie, uh, how could you miss that? But uh, generally, uh, as writers, we try to stay off the moment by moment. I shouldn't say we, because uh, many writers are absolutely the opposite. Um, but in momentous things like this, I would rather, hi, Lisa, hi, Roberta, I'd rather just let the moment unfold the way it's going to before I, and not, it's not a sporting event. It's not something that, uh, oh, God, did you catch that basket in the, no, uh, I don't need the moment by moment. Uh, my nerves are shot enough as it is. Uh, you know, it's not that I'm unconcerned. I'm very concerned, but I need to also be able to focus on uh, work and I'll focus on not falling into a deep depression or anxiety, panic attack, uh, etc. Because uh, I know I am prone to that and um, th that helps no one and nothing. So instead, I thought I... I bought a bunch of books at my local bookstore, All uh, one of my brilliant local bookstores, this one is Vroman's in Pasadena. Um, if you want there to be bookstores after the pandemic is over, uh, then you have to support them now because they need to continue to pay their staff and keep the doors open. So it is a really good thing to adopt a an independent bookstore. Decide which one you're going to support. I have two. Um, and start buying books. You know, buy them, put them away. It's, they're fully stocked. It's a great time to buy for Christmas. You know, no crowds, everything you want. Um, so I went, I bought books. I bought a calendar. I bought some really great ink, uh, for a fountain pen. I'm a fountain pen lover. And, uh, some, you know, fancy soap and whatever. And one of the books that I got, hi, Ruthie, hi, Shannon. One of the books I bought was uh, this, Linnell George. Um, uh, and it's about Octavia Butler. It's the world of Octavia Butler. It's called A, ha a Handful of Earth, A Handful of Sky. I know it's backwards. Um, a Handful of Earth, A Handful of Sky, which was her definition of science fiction. Um and Linnell worked on a, an exhibition at the Huntington of, of uh, Octavia Butler's uh, archive. And if you don't know who Octavia Butler is, she was a, um, an African-American sci-fi writer at a time where there were very few black sci-fi writers. There were just a, a handful. But she took a, she was writing from the time she was very small. She was uh, always sort of on out, uh, an outlier. She was tall, uh, really statuesque, uh, and as a young girl, that's always problematic. Um, and she was different. She was a dreamer. She read all those sad horse books that I love so much. I love reading that she was into those. And she would show her teachers her, you know, her uh, early work and get that not everybody was that supportive. And in her, her circle, you know, people don't always want to see you succeed. Um, people who have and this is just the way it is. All of you who've been writing for some time would know this. Uh, anybody who's been a human being for any length of time would know this. That people, 
some people want to see you succeed, are very excited for you, kind of your cheerleader section. And some people are not excited about your succeeding because it makes that they don't feel like they've done anything. They feel sort of like lacking inside. They've disappointed themselves. And so to see somebody who's not disappointed in themselves, to see somebody who's trying to do something hard uh, is very threatening to them. And they try to undermine you. And uh, uh, they did definitely did for her. She was a tremendous diarist. She was tremendous. She kept notebooks and diaries and, and notes to self the way we, the way many of us do, you know, to cheer, you know, inspirational sayings and cheer ourselves on. And uh, she was, it was so much fun to read this because there's a lot of illustrations. So you actually see the notebooks that she wrote in. You know, she always carried a little one, like I've been telling you guys to do. That was hers. Uh, there are quotes from her about, um, uh, you know, kind of controlling her psychology uh, and uh, inspiring herself as well as putting in her bills and all these things that are part of the reality of a writer's life. You know, she struggled. She was willing to sacrifice a great deal to do what she had to do. She had regular, she went to school or she had a regular straight job. She would get up at 4.30 in the morning and write because what was important to her was writing. And this book is so exciting. It is so uh, visually exciting. The ideas are going to be very much, you know, uh, what you're experiencing, especially in the early phases, but all through, we always have doubts. We always have to talk ourselves off the cliff. And you see, to see somebody who has won a, a MacArthur Genius Grant talk herself off the cliff is really amazing. She was learned to be very private. She talked to her diary uh, as if it was another person because she learned that other people could be problematic. Um, and she had to make sure that that was not going to impede her. Uh, she was in a writer's workshop where she was she was noticed by Harlan Ellison, who ran that workshop, and he like plucked her out of the chorus line. If you see photos, I did go to that exhibition at the Huntington, and you could see her, you know, very statuesque woman, you know, like on the edge of the of the picture, as if she you know, was just there on forbearance where he had all these other people who God knows what they were writing. But, you know, this was the genius here. But it's always that struggle with what you feel inside. And her talking about science fiction. And um, I remember there had been a lot of talk about, you know, black science fiction writers and uh, um, that it almost seemed like the Venn diagram didn't even come together. Why would black people be interested in science? And blah, 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 blah. And uh, whereas when you read this, you realize, you know, science fiction is a way to build a world that um, you can be in, be in the center of. I mean, it's so good. It is so good. So anyway, I'm, I've, I'm about a quarter of the way through. And uh, so I'll talk about it again. But all, everybody, you know, any struggling writer should have this book. It is so cool. And it's not too dense. You know, it would be a lovely book to give to a young writer, somebody, you know, who wants to see, you know, a great writer as, you know, as a child, as a teenager, uh, and as a young adult, you know, and as a full adult, you know, putting the bills in the margins, you know, and trying to f find the way to survive, you know, creatively and f in the world. Um, the thing that every writer goes through and, uh, um, you know, what she, what it cost her to do the work that she did. So that was unbelievably beautiful and, and definitely buy that for any, any young person who's doing a creative activity and buy it yourself because, you know, aside from age, we're all doing, you know, we're all doing the same thing is struggling to keep focus, to infuse passion, infuse, you know, uh, you know, to struggle towards greatness.
um, and what that takes and the mindset. It's such a good book. Okay. So I, uh, today I wanted to, um, talk about, uh, I had a question from Poppy last week that I, uh, I said I would do this week. So Poppy, if you're with us, this is your question. Um, and it's somebody who knows very much that um, I'm a on ice men. I started with on ice men was my idea of writing and what I wanted to do. So, uh, hey Janet, not sure if you have a video on this, but I struggle when it comes to plot or event in story. I'm an aspiring writer. Uh, very much experimental in developing stages. Took Joyce Carol Oates's masterclass on writing. I guess there's a whole series online. Um, and she also suggested starting with shorter forms, like we talked about last week, you know, mistakes beginning novelists make. Uh, good for you, JCO. I enjoy poetry because writing on a feeling or feelings seems to come more naturally to me. I love Nin's work because I love her interior landscape. Yeah, me too. Um, I feel drawn to the, es however, I would like to write a short story. I feel drawn to the esoteric, something I appreciate about Nin's work. House of Incest is one that comes to my very dreamy stuff. So I want to write a short story based on a dream I had but don't necessarily feel there's a story or plot there, even though I feel moved to write on this. Oh God, this is like me starting out. Okay, this is like a perfect picture of who I was when I was starting out. I like to write about amazing, you know, dream-like things and kind of evanescent moods and so forth and so on. Um, and I couldn't, you know, I couldn't have found a plot in there if it was, you know, covered in neon lights. Um, <sighs> could you possibly do a video on how to create good plots, events for short stories? I feel like Nin's novelettes aren't necessarily plot focused. No, they're not. Um, they're, I almost think they're writings sometimes more than or prose poems. Um, and, uh, you know, this was my difficulty as well. So I really relate to you, Poppy. Um, much like many other writers, I love Marguerite Dura, etc. Well, Dura tells a story. She's a, she has a filmmaker's, you know, eye for a story. Um, how do you create a short story that still feels like a whole story? even if there isn't much going on. And do you have any on how to come up with good plots events? So appreciate it. Well, this is a such a wonderful question. Um, hey, Zunaid. Um, it's a, such a wonderful question. You know, we talked about language for people who, you know, struggle with, uh, handling sentence and I told you I was going to do a class on that in January um, then you get the that's usually a problem with people who write like uh, often write for a living journalists tech writers copywriters you know they write a you know they can write a very straightforward prose but they don't have any flavor in the language. They don't notice things, you know, as we're talking a lot about the senses um, and internal thoughts and stuff. And then you, you have people on the other end of the spectrum. So it's very funny to do Writing Wednesday to a general group because I don't know where your weakness is. You'll have to, you'll have to, you know, potter around and figure out what you, what you need, what you need. And Poppy is clear that, you know, she has ideas, she has stylistic ideas, as Nin did in these um, other writers, um, but she can't get a plot off the ground. And really, you need both in fiction. It's the difference between writing fiction and writing poetry, is that poetry is an ex can be. Poetry can be 
an expanded moment and all these feelings and um, internals and stuff. That's very poetic, but it, it, it's, it's lacking something, which is the fire under the kettle and, you know, of a story that people are going to want to know what happens. People want to know what happens. So you have writers like Nin, but s certain writers who write in that style or that kind of sector of the, of the sky um, have more plot. Uh, you know, people like Ricky Ducournay is the first person who comes to mind. Um, and all plot is, is what makes the reader want to read on? Not just, not just beautiful language. So this is the flip side of what we've been talking about, right? Um, not just beautiful language, but they want to know what happens. So it gives them something to wonder about. What is going to happen to the djinn? Or what's going to happen to the princess? Or what's going to happen to that, the mistress of that this crazy guy um, and you know first of all it's about wrapping your head around the fact that something has to happen and what does that mean something happening that means that something occurs that the character cannot go back to the way it was before and one of the difficulties in writing extremely intro, introverted fiction, where it's all psychology and very little world, is it's hard to make something happen because what changes that person's world brings them out of the interior state and into conflict with the outside world and with themselves. Proust, there's somebody else. Things do happen, you know, they could be very small. Will my mother come and kiss me goodnight? Can I keep her here? How long can I keep her here? Um, but it's definitely conflict inside the character, you know, of his desire to possess his mother and her desire to go back to her guests. It's a little, it is, it, it's small, but if you're a small person and that becomes very important to you, that's something that happens. You know, and it's heartbreaking when she goes, leaves him to go back to the party uh, when she won't stay. Um, so whatever set, you know, for, you know, on the very basic level, whatever sets up that tension. I mean, classic, the classic plot or thought on plot is, I believe it's E.M. Forster. It's uh, the you know, there's the queen died and then the king, the king died and then the queen died, which is just stuff happening, you know, but nothing really happening, not dramatically. And uh, the king died and the queen died of sorrow. So cause and effect. Something happens, it sets up, there's a setup and a payoff. This is the very, very simplest kind of story. Setup and payoff, something you know, a stranger comes to town. There's two basic plots, somebody said. A stranger comes to town, and there's there's one other one. I forgot what it was. This is very easy to look up. Um, but they all, you know, it's like once upon a time, in a land far away, there was this and that and this and that. Um, and then one day, so it's that one day something different happens. Stranger comes to town. You meet some strange person. You are told you can never go see your friend again. Um, you are, somebody, you know, dies. There's a change. So think of a change. Think of delta in, uh, in uh, chemistry. It means the cha change. So something changes from A to B, a different mood. The character comes in in one mood, leaves in another mood. You know, so they come in anxious. They leave the scene in um, delight, delighted. Or they leave the scene 
humiliated or they leave the scene enraged. So you can always tell whether something happened because the mood changes. And I think when the very poetic writer writes a short story, uh, they often don't have a change of mood at all. Um, so take a look at the very introverted writers. You know, Anais Nin, um, she, her novel, I, her, I like her novels a lot. Uh, so, you know, sometimes the change is subtle. But you look at a book like uh, Spy in the House of Love, which is my favorite of her novels, it, there's definitely conflict and, and change. Um, and it always depends on character. So it, in, in regular fiction, short story or long story, classic you know, type of story, it's basically the, the five-step story structure. So that is uh, the um, setup is the need, the character need, there's a, a, a problem. The character, and then the character needs something to solve a problem. Then there's the, that's the setup, and then the character tries different things to solve their problem. This is like, think of every action movie ever. A character tries all kinds of things to make it happen. And then they realize there's something that they didn't understand about themselves or the situation. And when they shift their thinking about themselves and the situation, then they're able to solve their problems. That's a resolution, so illumination, resolution. So the five-step story structure. Uh, problem, need, running around trying to solve the problem, action, I think they call that. Uh, illumination, that realization, oh my God, you know. Um, and that's not a realization like, I use the, I use the story of Alien, you know. But you can use anything, you know, when they realize, oh, yeah, see, I can't do this because I've always belittled that person. I really, that's why this is happening. Uh, the illumination, and then they're able to solve the problem. So that's the basics, you know, that's any 30 second commercial is basically that. Then you go to the character-driven story, which is what I write and what, uh, what interests me. And the character-driven story is, I call that the XYZ, uh, the XYZ uh, formula for story writing. Uh, oh, I did a Writing Wednesday on the five-part structure, yeah. So, but the character-driven uh, story structure We'll have that sort of, think of that cause and effect, keep that in mind, but it's about character. It's about how you build the character to begin with. And then the story, Z, uh, A, X is the character and all of their different characteristics, their positives and their negatives that come into play. And then why is the situation that puts pressure on those particular characteristics, whatever this, whatever it is. Um, and then Z is what happens when that pressure is put on. So if you keep those two things in mind, that's very helpful. Um, I think that the short story can be extremely subtle. So I'm, you know, this this is sort of like big genetic fruit fly genes, you know, they're huge, clunky. You don't have to be clunky. If you like these very introverted writers uh, and sort of that dreamy state, you can be very subtle, but dreams will put pressure on whatever it is that you're afraid of. You know, a person who is afraid of spiders will have spiders, you know? So think about the psychology of your protagonist and how to put pressure on their situation.
you know, the the Rue in Lady with the Lapdog, you know, uh, who, I mean, his, his big change, his realization is that he's actually fallen in love with someone, you know, he's a seducer. And then he's actually fallen in love with him, somebody. And he, he learns at last, we see it. But he, it, he, it comes in towards the end of that story. And, and that's, then he has his change. So take a look at classic short stories um, and notice sometimes a short story doesn't have to do a lot. It's, it's not necessarily as, doesn't have to be like a huge movie ending. It doesn't have to tie itself up. It's sometimes it's just the curtain opens and you see something about the world and the curtain closes again. But that is definitely something that happens, and it change, there's a change in the reader after seeing that movement. So it doesn't even have to be the character changes. It could be that the reader sees something that changes the, that changes the situation. And that's, uh, these are, might be really good um, ways of dealing with this situation of a poetic story and how to get a little bit of conf you know a little bit of conflict it's got to have conflict and some movement some movement something something happening that the reader wants to read on not just because it's just, just a gush of language but because they're uh there is a um, some kind of a reaction going, a chemical reaction going on there that will leave the story differently than it began. So, anybody else want to ask about the short story? You know, um, I'm thinking there's so much, there's so many good short stories, and. It's good to read them and notice the changes. Notice the little, you know, the little movements in the story, the beats. Like really tear it apart and notice how the changes are achieved. Like where are they? And see if you can write it. Like what changes here? Uh, and then you can keep that loosely in the background as you're thinking about your story. Um, Mr. Twister. <laughs> that's one of my short shorts yeah uh the uh i've been reading a lot of short stories because i was writing a couple short stories before i started this new novel um and i've enjoyed them so much um that i just keep going back to them there's a always happy hour by uh Mary Miller, and the dark in the dark dark by Samantha Hunt, and then one of my uh, uh, students, um, uh, Olivia Clare, has uh, problems in the first world. There's a wonderful collection of short stories. Man, that woman is brilliant. So more band words. Hi. Somebody obviously flushed the toilet or something in my house. <laughs> I checked their phone or something. I don't know. How short can short be? Short, short, I say two pages double spaced is like the perfect short, short length. And the short, short is can be, I mean, really like a prose poem. Uh, but short story is a great place to play with. Uh, voice, a great way to play with structure. Maybe you'll have a very innovative structure uh, for your dreamy short story. You just have to figure out the, the changes that you want. I think that's going to be the most important thing. All right. Well, I think that uh, unless you have more questions uh, about the short story, I am, I'm not a sh 
great short story writer, I, I tend to write a 40 or 50 page short story, which Alice Munro, I'm reading, and this is not dreamy, this is not a poet's short story writer, but worth studying. I, I It was a book called Runaway, and the short stories are very long. I've got to say they're 40, 50 pages probably. But the moves that she makes, the shifts in time, the leaps in time and back and forth, and, and she can do a whole life in a short story, uh, generally something that people say short stories should be a very abbreviated period of time. But wow, those Monroe stories uh, can do a whole life. They're amazing. Um, other short stories. I like short stories. Um, Bear and His Daughter uh, collection by Robert Stone. He didn't write very many short stories, but they are really good. Um, very dramatic. Not dreamy, but, you know, super dramatic. I'm trying to think of people on the dreamier end, the more surrealistic um, writers, tend to be more experimental um, and definitely worth worth checking out. Even if you like to write, generally like to read long fiction, you can learn a lot from these moves that short story writers make. Um, but if you are a poet, basically, th this is poet, poet's problem, you know, is that they write so beautifully. And then they have to look at, uh, look at the plot and how do I write a plot? How do I write a story that somebody is going to want to stick with? Oh, Kate Braverman, read, you know, Tall Tales from the Mekong Delta, um, Squandering the Blue. She has a lot of short stories and they're beautiful and she's a very good short story writer. Um, the short story that sparked Painted Black how can we access that? I don't think that was ever published, was it? I don't know. A Shrine for Unbelievers. Maybe I'll send it out somewhere. <laughs> After the fact. <laughs> uh, that'd be interesting. Yeah, that's... Um, thank you. What else can I say about the short story? I mean, the long, twisty, the very subtle stories, Chekhov, they're very beautiful. And feel free to read about them before you analyze them. You know, there's no, you're not getting a grade now. It's all about understanding. So uh, feel free to read up on them before you read the stories. So, or read them and then read up on them and read them again. Um, who other poets are really good short story writers? Um, there's a memoir by uh, a poet, Lee Young Lee, that is I, I highly recommend. And there are scenes in it and things definitely happen, but it all comes back to central thought. Um, that is a really beautiful memoir and would have been a beautiful novel if I didn't know it was a memoir. That was gorgeous. Um, yeah, the moves that short story writers make, Cleanness by uh, Garth Greenwell, the the moves that he makes, are, they're very strong, it's very strong stuff. Um, so uh, if you're easily shocked, like, do not go there. <laughs> but... Uh, because he's, you know, he's writing that very physical stuff, and the character is uh, a couple of the, the stories. The characters uh, kind of addicted to S and M, so you know, caveat emptor, but uh, they are very strong and beautifully written. Um, the short story, right? Short stories have I read recently that I've just really gone nuts over. Sometimes it's just the ending. I, I tend to end things to with a hammer and nail you know i'm a novelist i'm gonna pound that thing in and uh with short story you know a lighter touch is better uh 
but it can't be so evanescent that the reader doesn't feel a change. They just feel a lot of language. Uh, then you're back to poetry. What else can I tell you? Is there anything before I wrap, wrap up? Well, I hope that you, this week goes well for you. Uh, you know, I, I, I can't tell you to stay off the news because everybody's different. Some people, you know, want to just, you know, mainline it. Uh, and they want to see every change as it goes along and have commentary with their friends, and with the public on Twitter. You know, they want to in a really fully engage with the breaking news. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm going to do less and really just take in the mainstream news <clears throat> at 6, 11, and try not to find the story behind the story and be the first to know. Because like so many things, it's like when you are, um, if somebody you know is having some kind of drama going on and you won't. You know, kind of curious as to what's what that's all about. I remember faculty politics when I was teaching at a university, and there were things that I, I really did kind of curious about. But I knew that if I wanted to find out really what was going on from the principles in the in the in the drama, that I would become part of it. So I'm like, better not, you know. Uh, I'll I'll rather get it secondhand than get involved with it. So uh, you're trading off front row seats for uh, peace of mind. And uh, right now I'm like doing the peace of mind thing. All right. Well, I wish you a good good writing. If if uh, you're having trouble concentrating right now, yeah. Oh my God, Be God, Wisconsin. See, I've been off the news. I haven't been watching it. Wow, Janet. Holy mackerel. <laughs> Gee. All right. Well, that's goodness. Yeah, we're blue. I don't have much blue, but uh, my little... Uh, this scarf is... Um, in Japan, the, the image of the carp climbing a waterfall is... Um, in paintings and on embroidery and stuff that they give to students because it's it's the scholar who the the young scholar who who puts in that effort to climb the waterfall so when i was in japan i got this because i figure you know writers also have to climb the waterfall and so i figured i wear something blue and red for for the election today Ah, oh, okay. Oh, Robert McKee has the strongest mind on thinking about story. Oh, well, I took screenwriting from Bob McKee when he's still teaching at SC, USC when I was in film school. And we quit at the same time. And he began a workshop uh, on the West Side in his apartment. Um, uh, screen, it was the only class I did well in. I was, I was a total washout in film school. Uh, but I don't, I think he, he's good, you know, he's good for film, but I think rules in general don't work for fiction. I think, you know, hold everything pretty lightly when you're writing fiction, because what happens on the page is the important thing. And rules are just like, you know, they're just touchstones. They're things to think about and keep in mind, you know but always be alive to the moment and what's going on and always moving, pushing something. You can tell when there's no plot. You can tell when you're in trouble. You're trying to dazzle the reader with language. If you're on, on that side of the spectrum, see, I've got this two, two kinds of writers, you know, which side of the spectrum do you fall on? But if you're good at language, if you're a poet at heart, you have to challenge this plot problem, the, the ability to tell a story, and then you'll be able to make the transition to fiction. So Bob McKee, uh, the, the, oh God, the negation of the negation. Don't try to 
force yourself into those shoes. You know, it's like stepdaughters trying to put on Cinderella's shoes. It's like, forget it. You don't really need it. You know, hold it lightly. Do have a very, if you have a very simple idea like XYZ, then it's easy to move it around and, and it applies to a lot of situations. Whereas something as detailed as Bob's book story, if it's 300 pages, that is too complicated. You know, don't, don't go there, you know, just a little tiny idea keeps you crossing the river, you know, helps you when you get lost, putting, my putting pressure on my character's salient characteristics. If not, I'm, I'm going, I'm going astray. Yeah, Bob. <laughs> I just saw, um, what's the movie where uh, they, they have a Bob McKee character um, adaptation. I laugh my head off. Oh my God. <laughs> uh, well, good luck, you guys. And, uh, and uh, we'll... Be here next week for Writing Wednesday, and I'll let you know um, when they've set a date and a sign up for the Art of the Sentence in January. All righty. Bye.